before we get started, Pastor, can I interrupt and kind of go back? To I found something. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm still camping on rest. <laughs> I'm still resting you. But I found something. Now, Kenneth Hagin, I don't know much about him, but I read, most of what I read him, I don't like. But his explanation of rest was kind of like, when we Explana trust, Explanation of what? Rest. Okay. That's rest. Okay, sorry. When we trust God with all our hearts, a quietness and peace comes into our spirit. Our hearts take the courage. Our hearts take courage as we read Scripture, as we meditate on God's word. Our assurance becomes deeper. This assurance is in our spirit, independent of our human reasoning or human knowledge. It may contradict human reasoning and physical evidence. Believing God with the heart means to believe apart from your body or your mind. So we are, as believers, presently entering into and living in God's rest. Well, kind of to a point, sort of, a little. <laughs> it made yeah. sense to a dummy like me. So, okay. <laughs> it it kind of, anyway. I mean, yeah, that explains the now part of God's rest, but it doesn't doesn't talk about the not yet part. That that's the problem. Of part, the problem. Oh, I, I see. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I, so, I, I, it, that. but though that kind of preaching, that's pretty normal because it's all focused on this life. But and, he could put it in ways that I could comprehend. Yeah. Anyway, that yeah, that's right. a good way of explaining it. Yeah, okay. Like I said, it just doesn't go far enough. No. Oh, okay. I, yeah, that word of faith movement. Yeah, that's the. That's the prosperity gospel. So it's yeah. very. Okay. Yeah, I it, didn't. I didn't like some of a lot of, I, and I don't follow him. I just happened to come across that and kind of research him a bit. But that said, oh, and I like what came up. Just sharing. Yeah. So if you're ever reading anything and you come across the term prosperity gospel, mm -hmm. uh, Kenneth Hagin was one of the big proponents. That he died in 2003. No, did. Yeah. I never. Heard of so yeah. So the prosperity gospel is you know the gospel. Of prosperity, that if everything in your life is right with God, the abundant life will come to you. Mm. Which the Bible doesn't actually say that. The Bible says your life is going to be terrible, mm. and for Christians, even worse. Yeah. Yes. But the not yet is what we look forward to. But yes. but yeah, that description of rest, as far as in our yeah. temporal existence, yeah. that's a great way to explain it. Sure. Okay, so today is Hebrews. Five. That's where we're starting. So we're only going to cover five, one through ten, because that's the only part that is in our lectionary readings. And again, we're not going to cover everything in the book. Uh, Hebrews five, one to ten, is used for the fifth Sunday in Lent, and it is also used on Good Friday. It's the standard uh, epistle reading for all of the lectionaries for Good Friday. So this will be very familiar, and there'll be a familiar name in it, and that's who we're going to talk about tonight. Okay, so chapter 5, for every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God. In order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, he can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided, since he himself also is beset with weakness. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins. As for the people, so also for himself, and no one takes the honor to himself but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you, just as he says also in another passage, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay, so we got to talk about Melchizedek. And I'm just going to read it. I wrote this, so I'm just going to kind of more or less read it. There's no more, I've said this before, there's no more enigmatic figure in the books of Moses, probably the entire Bible, than Melchizedek. He's only mentioned twice in Genesis 14 and in Psalm 110, and then in the book of Hebrews, where we just read it. The only other figure so mysterious 
in the Hebrew Bible are the Nephilim, which is mentioned in Genesis 6, and that's not part of this. We can go on all night about who they were. Uh, so you've got, you know, only a few things that are really mysterious in the Old Testament. The Nephilim and the giants are definitely one of those. But then this character Melchizedek. And uh, there's wildly diverse interpretations about him. Uh, you have the literal and you have the mystic. Uh, you have mystic uh, interpretations of him in the Old Testament pseudepigrapha, just like we have apocrypha in the New Testament, not equivalent to scripture. The Jews have their apocryphal documents uh, and their two big volumes of them. Uh, you can read them free on the internet too. Uh, it's got all kinds of crazy stuff like the uh, Gospel of Adam. Stuff like that, yeah. So there's, and that's why they're called pseudepiphraga because they're under a pseudonym. They're attributed to Adam. Adam obviously didn't write it. Uh, so you have extra biblical sources for some of this mystical stuff. Uh, and they've, they've written books about it. Uh, but when we look at the difficult passages of, the, of Scripture, especially historical passages that are difficult, the best way to deal with it is let Scripture interpret Scripture, and that'll get us what we need to know. And then we can also, we'll also see that when we talk about this Melchizedek figure, uh, like many of the other figures in the Old Testament, he is an archetype of Christ. So he's going to be pointing forward, obviously, to Christ, which the writer to the Hebrews acknowledges. Uh, some people consider Melchizedek, Melchizedek to be a theophany, in other words, a, a, a manifestation of the pre-incarnate Christ. I'll talk about why that's, and I love Christophanies and theophanies in the Old Testament. The glory cloud is the pre-incarnate son. Um, the burning bush, the voice in the burning bush is the pre-incarnate son. Uh, the voice in the garden in the cool of the day at the fall is the pre-incarnate son. I mean, the, Jesus is all over the Old Testament. The Son is all over the Old Testament. He's not yet incarnate, but he's there. But Melchizedek ain't that. Melchizedek is not a uh, uh, manifestation of the pre-incarnate Christ. And we'll, we'll see why I believe that as we uh, move forward. Um, so there's only three verses there in Genesis 14 uh, that talk about Melchizedek. So after his return from the defeats of Kerdolomir and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheba, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave, or Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Ener, Eshol, and Mamre take their share. Uh, so you see, there's just like one real quick, boom, there's this Melchizedek. And in the book of Genesis, chapters 12 through 22, uh, basically covers Abraham's entire faith journey uh, of his faith and his trust uh, in God's promises and also his doubts uh, when he encountered threats, when he encountered obstacles. Uh, and, then see, and then we see how everything unfolds and we see these promises uh, come to be true. And it all began with his call by God to leave his homeland, journey to Egypt, and Abram's tested the first time. He must present his wife as his sister uh, to preserve his life from Pharaoh. His whole family is then sent out of Egypt upon the discovery that Sarai is his wife. And then the Lord sent plagues upon Pharaoh because of her. After they left Egypt, Abram and his family travel with Lot to the Negev, to Bethel, uh, where he Abram constructed his first altar to the Lord. And then there, Abram and Lot separate. Lot goes into the Jordan Valley. Abram is in Canaan. 
as the land couldn't support both of them because they had huge flocks. So now the stage has been set for Abram to encounter Melchizedek after this great war of the kings that we just read about the ending of. Uh, so they're in the Valley of Sidim, where Lot was captured with all his family and all his stuff. And we see Abram now as a general. He's leading 318 trained men into battle by night, splitting their forces, defeating Lot's captors, getting Lot and his family back. And then now, after that battle, we see Abram encountering and being blessed by Melchizedek. And right after that, then we see God making a covenant with Abram. Uh, defining what lands would go to his descendants, which would be more numerous than the stars. We all know the story. And that Abram would enjoy a long life. And then he's tested again when Sarai is barren, and God tells him he's going to uh, have a son. And then Abram receives his new name for the Lord. And he also receives the covenant of circumcision, so that's the beginning of, of something new, a new, new covenant people. And then in chapter 18, we have a big-time theophany of Abram meeting these three strangers who he brings food and drink to, uh, which mirror the actions that Melchizedek had with Abram. Abram intercedes for, for Sodom to no avail, and then Sodom is destroyed. And you, you read through this narrative, the reason I bring up all that history is like, yeah, we know all that stuff, but... When you read through that story, then, this whole little incident with Melchizedek is like stopping in the middle of the church service to do announcements and then continuing. Okay, it just interrupts the flow. There are churches that do that, by the way. The, right at the prayer of the church, they stop, they do, they do announcements, and then they do the prayer of the church and go into the sacrament. It's bizarre. You get it right in the middle of the sermon. Yeah, it would. Intermission, then you can make it longer. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you, you have this whole narrative of Abram's journey of faith, and you have this little incident with Melchizedek that just is like there, right in the middle. Like, what, what does this mean? What is this for? Some scholars, in scare quotes, uh, say that that's so much so that those verses were inserted at a later time, which, no. Uh, that's dubious scholarship, and uh, nobody really follows that. But it has been said. Um, but this is also the very first time a priest is mentioned in the books of Moses. Uh, it is also, they are applying divine names to him. So that is already setting these couple little verses which are jarringly placed as being significant. Something's up here. This is important. And we need to figure out why it's important. Uh, and, there, and that's why there's so many writings you know, from... Jewish authors, Christian authors. Uh, John Calvin said, it's not to be doubted that God had constituted Melchizedek the only head of the whole church. Well, Calvin's not always wrong. That's a good thing to keep in mind. So you have the confluence of this office of king and the office of priest, which makes Melchizedek interesting, first of all, and ultimately is so unique that the writer to the Hebrews is inspired to reference him who is only mentioned in these couple of verses, to refer to Christ. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's in Hebrews 6, which we haven't got to yet. Or actually, we're going to be skipping it uh, because it's not used in the lectionary. Okay, so... An anchor, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, behind death, right? Where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. There's other ways that this strange figure is set apart, okay? His kingdom is Salem, which means peace. Uh, and that's widely recognized as being the early name of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, uh, the future kingdom of King David. And then Melchizedek's name means uh, king of righteousness. And that's also important. And he's described as being priest of God most high. There's, there's no Levitical priesthood yet, right? There's no Aaron, there's no Moses. This is all before that. So he's described as priest of God most high, the one true God. 
So Melchizedek is further highlighted by his priesthood to the one true God in the middle of pagan central. So they're surrounded by pagan religions. And then the way that his inter- Abram's introduction to him is injected into the text, like we mentioned before. And the structure of it is a, a, a literary device called a chiasm. Uh, so if you look at it, the way it bookends together, they make parallel passages because they're easy to memorize, and also it makes it stick out even more. So it'll say, Blessed be Abram by El Elyon, who is creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be El Elyon, who delivered your enemies into your hand. So there's a circle. Uh, it's a very Hebraic thought and way of constructing that. And it says that the entire this entire pericope in the Old Testament, this entire Bible story, centers around that blessing that Melchizedek gives. And then you have the contrast of Abram's response to Melchizedek with that of the king of Sodom, right? Abram doesn't want anything to do with the king of Sodom. He doesn't want to take a sandal strap from this guy, right? So he can say, oh, look what I did for Abram, right? But he's grateful for the attention by this king from Salem. And then look what he brings out, bread and wine. Hmm, what are that's foreshadowing? <laughs> and again, because why did Jesus use bread and wine? Because it would be on the table. Everybody's going to have it. Easy, right? But brings out bread and wine, huh? And Abram submits to his blessing, so he must recognize him as being a, a priest of a fellow worshiper of the one true God. And then he offers him a tithe of his war spoils. And then Luther, on, in his lectures on Genesis, said that he drew the connection between Melchizedek's bringing out and distributing bread and wine to Christ's institution, the Lord's Supper, because of course it would. That's what Lutherans do. Everything's about sacrament. Uh, from these points, then, we can see that Melchizedek points forward to not only the priest-king office of David, but ultimately the great high priest and king, Jesus Christ. So Melchizedek is a type of both David and Christ. There's some goofy stuff in the extra-biblical literature, and I'm, I'm, I like the Book of Enoch. I've read a lot of uh, stuff about Enochian literature that had some little information, too. Uh, some people believe that Melchizedek was immortal uh, and divine, and the Book of Enoch says that he was taken by the archangel Gabriel and deposited in Eden to preserve him from the flood. Hmm. Then Ephraim the Syrian believes that he is Shem. And we're going to come back to that because I think that's who he is. Uh, We'll talk about why. So Shem, one of Noah's sons. Uh, And St. John uh, Chrysostom, in his writing, he's one of the early church fathers, uh, he made a big deal about his lack of ancestry and uh, having no beginning or end to his life. Uh, so they're attributing, a lot of people have attributed so supernatural property. So you can see how a lot of people go, yeah, that's a prefigurement of Christ. That's a theophany. That's, that's God manifesting. Yeah, I don't think so. <coughs> and that comes from Hebrews 7.3, which says, without, you know, Melchizedek was without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, uh, may simply establish the facts that those Facts are not important, okay? They weren't mentioned because they're not significant historically. Uh, And what's theologically important is the obvious parallel between Melchizedek and Jesus because Christ's priesthood is valid because it came from God, just as Melchizedek's came from God. So Melchizedek is a type of Christ by the very lack of information about him except the validity of his office. And we'll come back to that. That's the key right there. The validity of his office is the only important information. So some say, well, his not having parentage or birth or death, he foreshadows Christ's virgin birth and being after the lineage of David. And, of course, Christ being God, uh, being with the Father from eternity and reigning over creation for all time. Eh, those are all great thoughts. Those are kind of pious thoughts, but I don't think so. Uh, Again, coming back to those angel-human hybrids, the Nephilim, 
Uh, the sons of God went, God went into the daughters of man because they were beautiful and they were married. Uh, and you've come up with some kind of angel-human hybrids. Uh, if, if you let scripture speak for itself, you have the sons of God, those who believe in the God of Israel, and the daughters of man, the people who don't. And they went into the pagan lands and took wives. That's what that means. There's no angel-human hybrids. Cool as that would be. That isn't what it is. But people try to find the complicated explanation to, to what's probably simple things. And we do the same thing with Melchizedek, trying to fill in these blanks, which were blank because they were intentionally <coughs> blank. So if we let Scripture interpret Scripture for Melchizedek, the simplest explanation is best. So his unique office, unique name, Unique actions. A king does not go out to a general and feed him. The general is summoned into his presence. Okay, it's like the it's like the father in the prodigal son. The father does not run to the wayward son and put a robe on him. He summons him to his presence. It just it wasn't done. Okay. Maybe they met in the middle. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> now there's no record of the Melchizedek being the dying. No. And there's, I, and I'll tell you why my reason, what I think that reason is for. I'll get to that in just a minute. Okay, so Melchizedek appears, boom, in these couple of verses, and he's never heard from again. But the writer of the Hebrews references him 2,000 years later. Why? Again, it's to highlight what was said and unsaid about him. So what if we forget this whole idea that possibly Melchizedek could be that Melchizedek could somehow be immortal or is he? Okay, well let's talk about it. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. All right, what if that's a title? It's not the name of the man. It's the title of the man. Just like Christ, the anointed one, is the title of Jesus, the Son of God. Okay, so at one at any time, there was only going to be one, just like there was only one high priest when that gets established later. But from the beginning of time, there was only one in that position. So the first Melchizedek, the first priest of the Most High God, was Adam. Okay, and then it was passed down father to son in that line. Seth, Methuselah. Methuselah outlived Lamech, so that's why that didn't transfer. Then Enoch was assumed into heaven. He didn't die. He was taken, just like Elijah. So it went from Methuselah to Noah to Shem. And the time for that would be about here. So the Melchizedek, I'm going to say the Melchizedek because it's a title. The, the Melchizedek that Abram talked to is Seth. And many, 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 many scholars have made that connection that it is Seth because he would have still been alive. And so you have this priesthood that was established by God from the very beginning that was passed down, Father the Son, all the way you know, to David, not today, to uh, eventually to Joseph and to Jesus. So it's a title. And, okay, great. That was really neat. We just spent 20 minutes on kind of a neat, remote, abstract part of biblical history. So what was the point of all that? The point is, what of the Levitical priesthood? What happens to Levitical priests? Well, they're no longer necessary after Christ. Yeah. Well, not... yep, they, they die. <laughs> right? They're... Oh, you know the 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 Levitical priesthood died; it went away. Uh, but the order of Melchizedek, Remains. which Jesus is because he's God and immortal, that is why he is a high priest forever. After the order of Melchizedek, after this holy ordination that took place from the very first man, all the way through. Uh, so it is his priesthood is ordained by God. And it is separate from the Aaronic priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. And there was only one, he is the only priest king. 
Right. And he's the only there priest no king. Other priest king. And he's not listed in the... Davidish, a little bit. Some will say David, but yeah, so there's no real other priest king. Uh, and there's only one. So Melchizedek is a title, not a name. And if you think it's Shem, then that makes sense. The Melchizedek at the time of Abram was Shem. Because like, you got to remember how long some of those people in the Old Testament lived. They lived. It's amazing to look at a chart and see who was still alive, like who Adam could have talked to, because he lived to be almost a thousand years old. You know how many people were alive when Adam was so alive that he could have told them that what it was like the day they broke the world? I bet that conversation never got easier either. Okay, so that order of Melchizedek was Adam's until he died, and it, so on and on and on and on. It passed along. And then, of course, Jesus inherited it, and because he was resurrected after his death, he can never die again. He is eternally the high pri our high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, and that is why the writer of the Hebrews injects that in there to show it, because we talked about all this other priesthood stuff we, we've been over the sacrifice system. We've been over the tabernacle. We've been after the ordination of priests and how the helpers uh, have to be consecrated, how the high priest has to be consecrated, all the stuff they had to do. And Jesus is still different than all of that and greater because his was you know, ordained separately from that. The, the Levitical priesthood was temporary. The Melchizedekan deacon priesthood is eternal. Plus, unlike the Levitical priesthood, Jesus' priesthood is able to remove sin, cleanse the conscience, purify the heart. Um, Hebrews 7.28 says, For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. So Christ's work in redeeming humanity from their sins is far greater than anything the Levitical priesthood ever did. They were kind of, again, uh, not a foreshadowing because it existed from the beginning, but it was just separate, different. Uh, because, yeah, because. Because he is our eternal high priest. And the whole point of it being brought up in, in Hebrews, I guess, is to say that, you know, Christ's work as our high priest is sufficient. Okay, so when a priest sinned, he had to offer a sacrifice for his sins, and then he had to offer a sacrifice on behalf of the people, and then they had to do it again, and again, and again, and again. Well, Jesus' sacrifice was a once for all, all-encompassing sacrifice. So again, that's why the writer of the Hebrews separate, why the preacher is calling out Melchizedek and calling this out as exceptional, uh, because that figure of Melchizedek in Genesis pops out like a beacon, like here is something that's really different. And then, of course, well, here is your high priest and king of eternity. Really popping out and highlighting how this is all separate, how the old covenant goes away, the new covenant brought in by Jesus is here to stay eternally. So that's enough about Melchizedek. That's about all you could talk about Melchizedek, actually. <laughs> Yeah, I wrote my term paper on him because it was it was too interesting to not research, just to find out, you know, how, how can somebody be mentioned in two verses of the Bible and have that much stuff written about him? Like, what are people saying? It was really interesting to go down all the, the different theories, and they're all, you know, have their merits. But I think that the hereditary one makes the most sense, that Melchizedek is actually a title. Because it is. King, it is. King of Righteousness is a title. So that's what we're going to talk about here in chapter 5. Right? Because again, we're talking about the perfect high priest. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men and things pertaining to God, right? Verse one, right there in verse 1. 
So that's the appointment of high priests in the manner of Aaron. God appoints a human high priest for the people to offer gifts and sacrifices for the people's sins. And then in verse beginning of verse 2, the high priest's ability to moderate what he feels about those who go astray so he can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided because he himself also has those weaknesses. He has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as we said. Okay, so that is why, you know, God appointed men to do this stuff on behalf of other men. But of course, we'll see that Christ is better than all that. And then the ending part of Verse 2, like we just said, his need to deal with, the priest need to deal with his guilt from his own sinful weakness is why he can be gentle uh, with these other people. And then verse 3, his weakness is the reason why he has to offer his own sin offerings. The, the offerings for the people, but also for himself. And then God's, God is the one that calls the high priest, not, uh, not by men's choice or a man's choice of himself. You know, you can't be a pastor because you say, I'm a pastor today. You can't do that. You have to be called, right? So the congregation has to call you. you have to, there's still the divine call, which people want to debate if that's real or not, but yeah, it's real. Believe me, it's real. Uh, and you run away from it for a long time. Uh, so, so not me. So you have the divine call, then you have the actual call, the physical call from a church. Uh, you can't just drop in and say, hey, I'm going to be your pastor. You can't do that. <laughs> that doesn't work that way. I, you could probably do that, and people might follow you for a while. But uh, all right, So no one takes the honor to himself, but he receives it, all right, just as God has done from the beginning. All right, and then we change gears uh, in verses 5 and 6. So then, of course, Christ did not glorify himself, quite the opposite so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, you are my son today, I have begotten you. Just as he says in another passage, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Did you, excuse me, yeah. at the second time I heard you say, did you say, are you saying the word adopted? Did I say adopted? I don't know. Uh, verse six. Verse six. Uh, just, uh, you are a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Yeah, it must be about I, I'm begotten. No, I said begotten. Begotten. Oh, <laughs> I'm adopted. I no, 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 no. We are not adoptionists. So yeah, that's actually a thing. That's a thing, and it is a heresy. Okay. Although the word adoption is used in the New Testament a couple places, but it doesn't matter what we think it means. Uh, so yeah, that that was one of my. I mean, we'll, we can have this discussion. Uh, that was. Well, the toughest part of my theological interview, which is your last step before they tell you you can get ordained, is you have to get grilled by a couple guys for a while. And I said, well, explain begetting to me. That's the question I got. Explain what it means to be begotten and explain it to me like I'm five years old so I can understand it. And I just went, what? <laughs> and so I, being being the, the good... The, good seminary student that I was, I pitted them against each other immediately and said, well, that's a pretty lofty question. How, how can you explain the getting as to a five-year-old would understand it? And then immediately they started sniping at each other for about 20 minutes and then they were actually had to answer the question. This is a time-honored strategy. You're supposed to find out who is doing your interview ahead of time, find out what their button issue is, and try to get one to get on the other about it so that you can just fade back and run out the clock, basically. <laughs> like In case it. you ever wondered how these things go. So I'm you get all involved with the Sadducees and Pharisees. Pretty much exactly <laughs> like that, yes. Yeah, and the, the fun thing is, is then they then you, you get all done with this grilling. And then they, they send you out of the room to like, because they're going to talk about you and see how you think this guy's going to make it. And but they actually, they're just sitting there like this, looking at the phone. <laughs> Has it been long enough? Yeah, call back in. <laughs> so they call you back in and you're like, Ugh. right? And it's like, okay, well, yeah, you're good. We're going to approve you. It's like, oh, okay. And they, then once all the pressure's off, I asked them, I said, can I ask you guys a serious question? And they're like, sure. It's like, do we all sound like complete 
idiots <laughs> during these things because, you know, I just like the questions answered like, like boom, boom, boom. Because I, now that I have no pressure on me, I can spit it out exactly where it is. And they're like, oh, yeah, you, know, you guys all sound like that. That's kind of the point. It's a, it's a good time. <laughs> that we know you. If we didn't think you knew this stuff, you wouldn't even got this far. But, yeah, it's, it's just, ugh, it's excruciating. I would pay to see that. So, but, <laughs> well, one guy, and this is brilliant. I mean, it's a pretty sharp guy, too. Because his question was, you know, there were talking about the Trinity and it's like okay and he was you know explaining it the best you can without doing any of the heresies which every analogy we use is actually a kind of heresy because it's just not a complete example so he's sitting there and he's explaining it and the professor's like you know yeah no I don't I don't agree I don't think you're doing this he's like well I'm going to claim and I don't know what verse it is but it's like Deuteronomy 20 something 20 something and it basically says I will let the mysteries revealed by God be revealed and those that are, remain clouded remain clouded and I said that's like where I think I have to stay on this and they're like that's a good answer <laughs> it's like you should have started with that you've been a lot shorter so begetting well when we say beget it means I, I've, I've begotten a son I had a baby and here's a baby but that wasn't a baby nine months ago but that's not what begotten means because Jesus Christ is eternally begotten of the Father from before the creation of the universe. And there was never a time when he wasn't. That was Arius' error, which is why the Nicene Creed was written. Because he believed Jesus, the, the Son, was created at some point. Oh. And so that was the Arian heresy. So he said uh, there, was always, there was a time when he was not, is his famous little quip. Uh, so begetting isn't the same as birthing. So what is begetting? Well, he, the father begot the son. I, I, you are, today you are my son. When that day was, when there was no time. I don't know. So this is where we claim Deuteronomy 20, 20, whatever. It's like that which has been revealed is revealed and that which remains vague is vague. I don't think we can actually give a definition of what begetting means. It's like the father claims the son as his. But that happened from eternity. Now, right there, that's our out. We are creatures of time and space. We inhabit these four dimensions. And we can't, until we go to heaven, we can't get out of them. So if the sun was begotten before eternity, which is what the creed says, like, what does that even mean? It means it's out of my... Experience. I cannot experience what that means. I can't define it by hum with human words because, by definition, this is taking place outside the scope of human experience. It's outside of time, outside of space. Right? So, do we understand what it means when it says the Father begat the Son? No. I don't think we can. Well, we are. God knew us before we were conceived in our mother's womb. Mm -hmm. So, we begat too. Yeah, we were begat. Begetted? Beget, begot, Be, begotten. Begotten. <laughs> begotten. I don't think that they were waiting for a certain amount of time that they were just going to get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Get this guy out of here. Because you know, they're in the, I don't know where it fits in. Yeah, but, but you see, it, because we can't experience something outside time and space mm -hmm. other than the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. uh, since we have no experience for that, we can't understand it. And that's, that's where I count. Because, okay... Otherwise, it's adoptionism, and that's the heresy. We can't say, well, the father adopted Jesus as the son. No, he didn't adopt him. He, just, like, just as any father begets a son, the father begot the son of God. But what that means, we're trying to anthropomorphize it. We're trying to define it in human terms, and we can't because we're talking about God, and we're talking about two persons of the Trinity, that's a whole lot of paradox, confusion, stuff that's not been revealed to us in one breath. So I, I don't get too hung up on that. And every time you ever ask it in confirmation, the kids always ask, well, what does begotten mean? And the pastor always does some, like I just did tap dances for about 10 minutes. Says, we don't really know. It just means that the father acknowledges his, him as his son. And he did that from forever, literally. Yeah, because I was looking why the NIV uses today, I have become your father. It's a terrible translation. Yeah. Yeah. 
because that nails it down. There is no mystery. That's adoption. Not with the time. Right. Put the time on it. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it says, you are my son today, I've begotten you, but when was today? Hmm. That's today. Is it all times and spaces? Yeah, kind of. Infinite? Yeah. Yeah. Because, as we said in the Athanasian Creed, right? Three persons, the Father infinite, the Son infinite, the Spirit infinite, the Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated. But there are not three uncreateds, but one uncreated. It's like, and now throw in beginning in there. Oh, great. Yep. So it all boils down to, because you they'll look at that, look at all that fun stuff you have in one verse, two verses. You have begotten and you have Melchizedek. So that sticks out in Hebrews, doesn't it? So regardless, the Father designates the Son from eternity to be this high priest. So this is a forever call, forever call. The call of the high priest of the Levitical line, that's, that's finite, that's constrained by time and space. The Son, not, just like his begetting is beyond time and space. So is his priesthood. So is his sacrifice. His sacrifice once for all for the sins of everybody that's ever going to live, ever has lived, is living now. There's That's a lot of infinites going on. Did that just confuse everybody or does that make sense? I'm trying to kind of basically say this is kind of a little big for us to wrap our heads around and I don't think we're meant to. Just the, the whole point is God said it. It's forever. And it is. <laughs> and that's, it, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord. And now we're done. Yeah. Right. And this, uh, after he was perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. That what verse are you looking at? Uh, verse 9, I'm sorry. Yep. After he was perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. What version are you reading? And I think. You see, there's a, sorry, I didn't even do that so loud. That, that is why I don't, that is why I don't like the NIV, because that's a careless verb tense translation, and see what it does. Readers again, one more time, what was that verse I say exactly? Uh, after he was perfected, after he, he was became perfected. the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And then there's, and actually then verse 10, and he was declared by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay, after he was perfected, which implies a time when he was not that's, perfected. That's, right. that's why that's a terrible translation. Uh, verse 9. ESV yeah. has the same, it's the same word. Does it have, the, what, what does it have? Yeah. Is this, you want me to read it? Yeah. Okay. It's the same thing. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. That does not say the same thing. It does No, it doesn't. After he was perfected, that's what the NIV has. And yours has what? After being made perfect. After being made perfect. How is that different? It's still not that great. That that's why I like I like what NASB has having been made perfect, not implying that there was a time he wasn't perfect. He was made perfect, but that implies he was made. Yeah, so it's. There's a time that he was not. Yeah, this is the Christian standard. It's the same thing with the uh, it's the uh, NIV, but that that, that kind of. Although he was the son, verse eight. Yeah, tell e, tell e, I, tell e, o, tell e, tell a, o, o. I'm a tell i, o, o. Tell e, o, o. Tell I, o, o. It's a stupid word. Sorry, it's, not, it's got two o's in a row. Yeah. Uh, that means to. Uh, I just lost my place. Brain dead. Um, uh, accomplish, initiate, fulfill. It has all those connotations. Which, okay, did you initiate it or did you fulfill it? That means the beginning and this means you end it. Well, could it be both? Because it, it is both. It's, again, it's all time. Uh, it is a state of being, I guess you would say. Yeah, it's a weird, 
It's a weird verb. It's a hard verb. I mean, we have to say it in English somehow so you can actually read it, and that's why they translate it. But every translator has a little bias when they translate. All translations have that. They have to. People do the translating. If we look at... Look at I don't know. Okay, I'll skip ahead a little bit. So let's talk about that one because that's a difficult passage. You know, after he was perfected or having been made perfect, uh, read the rest of the verse. He became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. So what is this, this perfectedness we're talking about? So there's got to be a part that wasn't perfect? What? What are we talking about? So are we talking about... Well, let's ask this. Is it, are we talking about the son before or after his incarnation? Before or after, I'm sorry. His incarnation. After his incarnation, because from what he suffered and once made perfect. Okay. So this is after his incarnation, so he's in possession of this. I'm playing devil's advocate. I know, okay. I know it's his incarnation. So he was made flesh, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, but he was made perfect flesh. Okay, so he was made flesh without sin. We're made flesh with sin, with original sin, because we're people. He was made flesh without sin. And became the source of eternal salvation. So he had to come, he had to come to earth to suffer as a man in order to uh, perform perfect obedience and righteousness of uh, ideal obedience and, and righteousness are the same thing. So when you talk about a perfect, a perfect obedience, a sinless obedience, that is righteousness. Right? So Christ became perfect and ideal righteousness in the flesh, which is something a man could not do before, but he did. Although he was the son, he learned obedience right. from what he suffered. Right. Okay, so... Because he became that ideal righteousness in the flesh, his death could cover the sins of man. It had to be that way. I mean, God could have rescued us any other way. He wanted to, but he didn't. He did it by entering his own creation and living as one of his creations in the form of one of his creations, even though he's uncreated. And living that way, the way he had ordained us to. Because that was the only way he could, because he is a just and right God. That is the only way his own law could be fulfilled. And then that sacrifice could atone for all of us. It had to be that way. So, in other words, no, it couldn't have been any other way. We have some other verses that we could use. That's, that's why we do the scripture interpreting scripture thing. To help us understand. So if we look at John 8, 46. By the way. John 8, 46. Yeah, this is a hard passage. There's, there's some things here that if you read it the wrong way, you can go down a bad path. Uh, 8, 46 says, Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? Jesus said. And then 2 Corinthians, and you'll see how these connect. And then 2 Corinthians 4.15 says... Hmm? The second one is... Uh, 2 Corinthians 4.15 says, For all things are for your sakes, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. You know, this is all Jesus' work does this. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him who, this is one of my favorite verses. Mm -hmm. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Right? So he became the ideal righteousness so that his righteousness would cover our sin, which in turn makes him 
sin. The one who knew no sin, he actually became sin. And felt all the weight of it. Okay, then and even in Hebrews, Hebrews 2.10, if we go back, says, For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. Okay, so that's again talking about, you know, Jesus becoming the author of our salvation. He had to experience, just as we said at the beginning of the uh, cha- end of chapter four last week, we talked about that verb sympathy, which doesn't mean, you know, I feel sorry for you because this happened. I sympathize with your plight. It's, I feel it. It's like, okay, I have a sympathy. My, my cells vibrate with your vibrations. Your pain is my pain. Literally, I feel that. That's what Jesus had to do with our sin. So that's when it says we do not have a high priest who does not sympathize. That means Jesus felt everything you can possibly feel. He knows what he's talking about. Uh, I just got lost. Hebrews 5, 9 says, having I mean, that's, yeah, we just read that. Uh, 5, 9, 7, 26 says, for it is fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices. So it's again connecting those dots. And then 8.1. Now is the main point, and what has been said is this. We have such a high priest that keeps repeating this, who is, has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens. And then Hebrews 10, 21 and 22 say, And since we have a great priest, you hearing a little repetition? And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean with an, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Okay, so all this action of why, the why, the why, the why. Why did this have to be? He had to be. He had to be that perfect righteousness to do, accomplish these things. Okay, so I'm going to run through these notes because I kind of we kind of skipped to that first, and this might help make it click. All right, so starting in, at the beginning of that chapter again. So the the high priest must be appointed by God to represent man before God. Right? The man is taken from among men. He knows and understands what it means to be a man. Okay, The high priest knew that. He represents man in the things of God. He leads prayer, worship, righteousness, morality, study of spiritual things. It's all stuff I do. Except I don't do it. I do it like one of those high priests in, in the Old Testament. I do it badly. You know, right? Which is why they had to offer the sin offerings. It's like why I have to confess my sins too. Okay? Ordained by God. He does not choose to do this. He is chosen. I think we established that. The high priest offers gifts and sacrifices for sins because unless sins are forgiven, he can never be acceptable before God because no man can erase sins. Okay, the high priest must be able to be compassionate to the two types of men. You have the ignorant, that's those who sin without knowing they're sinning, and those who willfully sin. Which group do you think is harder? <laughs> it's the second one, right? It's it's not that hard to explain to somebody, you know, you shouldn't do that, and this is why. Oh, okay, I shouldn't do that. But once you tell like, you know you're not supposed to do that, yeah, no, so what? That's a little harder to get through, right? And then when it's yourself, yeah, I know, but so what? Hmm. It's kind of interesting that the high priest was supposed to have compassion on who he was ministering to and not look down on them because of their sin. Yes. And Jesus did being the same. Yeah. sinless can look at us and he understands and sympathizes with what we're going through. Yeah, think about that. That breaks your brain thinking about that. If anybody that can look down on you, he's the one that didn't. Yeah. And then does that doesn't that make the the Pharisee party that much more ironic? Yeah. That like how badly they lost their way. Yeah. We even can see it. 
looking back, and you know, it's just like, hey, the high priest was supposed to be cool yeah. with these people because he had to offer his own sin. Those people thought they didn't sin. You know, we talked about this earlier. When did Jesus ever call out anybody on their sin? He didn't. He might say, well, you know, yeah, none of those guys have been your husband, but he didn't call her out on it. He just kind of says, you know, I, I, I know, I know, I know who you are. But then he says, you know, here is living water. He didn't, he didn't condemn her. The only sin he ever condemned was hypocrisy and unbelief. It's like, believe that I can take care, take this yeah. away for you. That's the only sin he called people out on. Otherwise, he just called out the hypocrites who didn't think they were sinners. He never called people out on their stuff. We're really good at that. But <laughs> Jesus never did it. I mean, show me one passage where he does that. He might say, now go and sin no more, or something worse will happen to you. Didn't he do that to the money changers in the temple, though? His behavior? Maybe he didn't speak directly to each one individually, but the whole action... Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, don't make my father's house a house of trade. Um, that was more righteous indignation, I don't know. I mean, yeah, he called them out on that sin because he didn't want it there, but I think that almost counts as a special example. I mean, he was really mad, and he had the right to do that. Yeah, that was a, that's a special situation. But yeah... That is an example of him calling somebody out on a specific sin. He didn't call out an individual. No. no but the, 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 I, think he made his, I think he made his point. He did it twice. Yeah. You know? He did. So, yeah, that, that's a good example. Thank you. Right? And then the high priest has to remember that he too is guilty of both, both being ignorant and sinning willfully. Okay? The high priest has to offer sacrifices for his own sin before sacrificing for others. And the high priest must be God appointed, not self appointed. So that's verses one through four. And then verses five through 10 show us the qualifications necessary to be the great high priest. These are the qualifications to be the Christ, right? So he had to be incarnate as a man, sent into the world by God, known by prophecy, going all the way back to Genesis 3.15. The first prophecy of the promise of Messiah was given to the first Melchizedek, Adam, right there. God's irrevocable oath that his son was to be a priest. John 3.16, Hebrews 2.17, Hebrews 5.5. 5. Uh, Christ suffered bitterly as a man and then illegally sacrificed himself. He suffered beyond any other human suffering or experience. So he suffered the sins of the world on the cross, not just being nailed to a cross. So he suffered the pangs of hell on the cross. Right? And then, then you have that picture of him in Gethsemane that of his struggles, like, I don't want to do this. But I'll do it if I have to. But I don't want to do it. Take this away, I don't want to do this. I mean, that's human. How very human that was. Okay, so Christ willingly came to earth to do all this. So I go, by the way, my son who was begotten of me from eternity, you have to go be born a baby. <sighs> really? Okay, and you know, he probably didn't go, really? Good, so I'm on it, right? Okay, so Christ willingly came to earth to do this. God could have gone another route. Maybe he's like, oh, it's like a vacation. I don't know. I get to be a baby. Yeah. Okay, God could have gone another route, but it was God's will and Christ's only path to complete obedience. He to completely obey the law that God created that we broke he had to be a man. He had to become incarnate, all right? So that it was fulfilled. So every qualification of the priesthood, of all these weeks past that we talk about, all that stuff, Jesus fulfilled that too, and then some, all right? And then he also experienced obedience. And this is kind of a subtle point. He experienced obedience by learning to obey God as a man. Why did the devil have to tempt him? Why did the spirit drive him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil? The devil knew who he was, but he said, oh, I haven't seen this before. This is different. Well, let's see what he's made of. He was a man. Okay, he was a man. So now he had to experience obedience to God as a man, fully human, fully divine, though he didn't take, make use of his divine nature all the time. 
or completely. So he had to learn to obey God as a man, suffer as a man, die as a man. And there's too many scripture references for John chapter 10, Galatians, Ephesians, Titus, Revelation chapter 1. Uh, so Christ was made perfect flesh. Right? He was begotten, not made, but he was made flesh. John's gospel says that the word became flesh. And he became the source of eternal salvation because of all that fulfillment. Okay? He had to come to earth. He had to suffer as a man in order to secure perfect obedience, ideal obedience and righteousness, which is all the same thing. And that without sin is critical. Christ became perfect and ideal righteousness. It couldn't be any other way because it would not have been able to be applied to us. And Christ was appointed by God to do this. So God appointed and sent the Son after the eternal order of Melchizedek, not the transient and dying priesthood, human priesthood of Aaron, but this eternal order established from the beginning and then established forever. Because once Jesus died, he can never die again. He conquered death, so he is our high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, these fellows who carried that title. That's it. That's that's chapter five. That was a good chapter. Yeah. See, one verse about McKees, that see what you can get. <laughs> I, I have a question. Sure. We've been talking about Christ begotten mm -hmm. from God. Was the Holy Spirit begotten? No. Remember that line in the Athanasian Creed, uh, the, fa the Son, the Father is uncreated, the Son is uncreated but begotten. And then the Spirit is neither, is uncreated, not begotten, but proceeding. And so that's the proceeding, the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, as it says in the Nicene Creed. And that's the difference between us, one of the differences between us and Eastern Orthodoxy. They do not acknowledge that line that, that the Spirit only proceeds from the Father, not the Father and the Son. And that's based on one verse of Scripture. Don't ask me what it is off the top of my head. I think it's in Thessalonians. Which one is it? Huh? <laughs> uh, but it, it says that the, the Spirit is uh, sent. Uh, by, and then actually, that's a little facetious. I mean, professors always says, yeah, there's this one verse that talks about procession, but there's more. Because every time the Father, the Son talks about Sending the Spirit. That's the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son's will. You know, the, the Father sent the Spirit onto the Son in his baptism, and the Spirit rested on the Son until his death on the cross. Okay, so he sent, so John the Baptist saw him as the form of a dove. He saw the Spirit descend on him, the Spirit was on him, protected him. And then when he died, he gave, he returned his spirit, the spirit of God, to the Father. You know, into your hands I commit my spirit. I'm giving back the spirit that you placed on me at my baptism. And he sent it back again at Pentecost. And he sent him back again at Pentecost because he had to go away. He had to die. He had to rise. He had to go away because otherwise, if he stayed, I mean, yeah, he could have, I suppose he could have sent the spirit off himself. But yeah, well, you said this, the helper can't come unless I go away. So, yeah, so the, the, the whole idea of the spirit proceeding is another one of those theology terms that you're going to have a discussion like this one, and we can come up with a whole bunch of Bible verses, and at the end, you're going to go, but pastor didn't answer the question. No, I didn't. <laughs> That's another one of those uh, tough ones. I'll have to see what Martin, I trust Martin comments. He probably has something to say about that. Either him or Gerhardt, they were two great Lutheran theologians that had a way with making this stuff make sense at the time you read it. And then a couple weeks later you go, I still don't get it. Which, so yeah, I, I didn't answer your question. I don't think. Um, That's okay because we're not going to know everything here in us anyway. No, the whole, the whole Trinity thing is hard. I mean, on the surface it's easy. There's three persons. They are all fully God, but they're distinct. But we don't have three gods, we have one God. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what that means. That I can't wrap my head around that. Uh, 
who wrote a book on that? Gerhardt. Gerhardt wrote an entire commonplace in his theological commons, this huge thing of doctrine. Uh, he wrote a whole thing on the Trinity, and when you get done reading it, you don't know anything more. Just like Chemnitz's book on the two natures of Christ. You can read the whole thing. It's a great book, and you're like, wow, I really understand this. Until somebody goes, well, how, how is he fully God and fully man at the same time? And like, you're like, <laughs> because the Bible says so. <laughs> you ever had a little kid ask you about the Trinity? Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's so many well-meaning Sunday school teachers that screw it up. It's like, well, you know, the Trinity, there's a Lutheran satire for that, by the way. Uh, of course you, know, the, the, you know, the Trinity is like the sun because we can see the light and we can feel the heat. That's partialism. That's a heresy. Or it's like this three-leaf clover. <laughs> that's modalism. You know, it's, or no, I'm sorry. The sun one is modalism. The three-leaf clover. Well, it's like the three persons of the Trinity. It's one shamrock but there's three leaves and that's partialism that's a heresy every one of those analogies you come up with is bad instead you just say we worship the trinity and unity and the unity and trinity three persons one god anything beyond that we don't know we should have said that from the beginning patrick yeah it's a great little cartoon i need to see that yeah i in fact when we took our trinity class 10 weeks of what we just did it in 30 seconds, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and still don't know how to explain it, right? So I showed, I, I was showing it to the guys in class, like, how can you guys be Lutheran pastors if you have never seen Lutheran satire? It's like, here, so we're watching about the Trinity, and the professor comes and goes, what are you watching? Lutheran satire about the Trinity, because everything I know about the Trinity, I've learned from this. He's like, well, put it on the board so we can all watch it. He's like, yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> so can we go home now? No. Yeah. <laughs> nice try. Well, we did other stuff, too. It's like, how are they going to talk about the Trinity for, for 10, 10 weeks? weeks? Well, it was an intensive, so it was the 10-week class crammed into a week of no. nothing but that class. Still a week. Yeah. And, and we had a test. A day went by. It's like, how can you give us a test on something we can't understand? Like, that's ridiculous. That's kind of mean. Yeah, I know. My mom taught Sunday school. Well, you know, he's German, so that's what they do. <laughs> but when kids would ask my mom about the Trinity, she'd be like, you need to ask the pastor. <laughs> well, you know, the Trinity is like, you know, water, you know, it, when it's, it could be steam, it could be liquid, it could be, ice cubes. it could be ice cubes. Yeah. That's okay. also a heresy. Which one is that? Um, modalism, partialism. Can't think of what that one's called, but there's a heresy named after it. So that's a bad analogy too. Wouldn't it be called modalism? Hmm? Modalism? Not modalism. That's not modalism. Yeah. Okay. There's modalism, partialism, and there's another ism, and I can't remember it. I have to, I have to watch that cartoon again. Yeah. That one says that the Father was the Son, and He appeared. He's only one God, and uh, He appears in different disguises or masks. Right. Sometimes so, the yes. Father, sometimes the Son, sometimes as the Spirit. Yeah, so that's modalism. That's the same as, you know, saying we see the heat and we feel the light. See the light from the sun, we feel its heat. And then the same thing is like, well, sometimes it's a liquid, sometimes it's a gas. That's all modes of being God. And it's, no, it's not the same. The trillism, is that T-R-I-T-H-E-I-S-M? Tritheism? Oh, tritheism. Tritheism, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that winds up, you have three gods. Yeah. So, yeah. Which is what the Muslims accuse us of. Yeah. Except they think it's the, they believe it's the Father, the Son, and the Virgin Mary. They leave the girl who goes out of it. It's just like, the Virgin Mary? It's, don't like, trust you. it's like, don't listen to the Catholics. <laughs> but yeah, so. And she really didn't come around. Hmm? She really didn't come around to be worshipped until much later. Way later. Well. Way later. And, and some of that developed out of, like, oh, well, if, if Jesus was born... This perfect flush, born without sin, but what about original sin? That means Mary was born without original sin, and that's how that all got started. Yeah. And it's like, but then what about her mom? Yeah, it's like, somebody had to be born without original sin. Can't it just be the Messiah? I never understood that. See, that's what the, that's what the immaculate that's what the immaculate conception is. Everybody always thinks it's. Uh, the virgin birth is the immaculate conception. No, it's Mary's birth without original sin is the immaculate conception, which is not a thing. Did they? I think they changed their mind on that too. 
that that's oh, not a I, thing anymore. I was, uh, we always thought that she was not. She was, we were taught she was a perpetual virgin. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, if you read our if you read our confessions, uh, we technically say it too. Yeah. Well, what? So. What about Judas and James and Simon and all those ones mentioned in Matthew? I would not have wanted to be the uh, midwife at those first. Yeah. <laughs> Was it Joseph? I, they love Jays. I just called today. I'm going to read you not too much. Jesus, Joseph, Jude, James, James, James and Simon. <laughs> she, she loved Jays. <laughs> well, look at Amy's kids. Huh? All oh, Amy's kids are James. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. James. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Poor Jacob, I mean. <laughs> All right. We'll call that a wrap for today.